Hi everybody, here we are. We're back in the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. It's Tuesday afternoon, so it's turning Tuesday, three o'clock. Today's subject is all about finishing. Um, whether that be sanding, whether that be polishes, waxes, sealers, all those sorts of things. We've asked today to get some um, questions in. I've got Craig on questions, and I know already we've got pages of the things, so um, we, we've got a fair amount to get through. Ben's on camera, um, so I think we may as well get started. I've got a little bit here to start working on. We're going to look, one of the, the, um, the requests before we started was about layering up colour, so I've got that prepped and ready. Before we go too far, though, we're going to go straight into a few questions from Craig. So, Craig. Afternoon, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, we've got uh, a good number of questions, Colwyn. So, you ready? Good. Yes. Okay. Far so away. First question from Ian. Um, how do you remove end grain from the inside of a bowl? Would you recommend applying a sanding sealer and reversing the direction of the lathe? Okay, Ian, right. Um, the the deal with end grain in, in, in bowl turning um, and everybody gets it. Don't think it's um, it, it's unique to yourself. Unfortunately, it's one of the parts of, of uh, bowl turning. Several ways you can eliminate that before you get to the sanding stage. Sealer, um, by the time you get to sealer, really, it should be gone, if I'm honest. The thing to do, what you, what you find, certainly with a bowl gouge anyway, is you think about your bevel of your bowl gouge as a flat surface. You're trying to push that bevel around a, a concave surface of the inside of your bowl so you've got the heel and the toe of the cutting edge um, contacting that tears the grain out so you get those opposing edges of your internal bowl surface um, being torn so the ways that you can um, uh, sort of help to eliminate that certainly put a secondary bevel on the bevel of your bowl gouge that would really help because that will create more of a convex um, profile to match the concave of your bowl you could um, shear scrape as you um, as you cut. That would help as well. Um, and unfortunately, you just start really, really coarse power sand, all those sorts of things if it's a real issue. Punky timbers, so really soft ones, yeah, sanding sealer, um, and allow the sanding sealer to dry properly before you start sanding. That, again, will, will, will help you with that. Getting a good finish off the tool is going to be your best ally, though. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Alan asks, you briefly mentioned last year about branding irons and possibly looking into them. Um, any more news on that? Well, branding irons is not something as, as a company axmints to do, um, but Finley, uh, Finway Design, so my son Finway, he's a, um, a designer and he designs logos for makers. So uh, whether that be um, websites, whether it be um, uh, stickers, transfers, um, and now brands, he can do that. In terms of the company that does the brands, that's a separate company again. If you contact Finway Designs, Lily has the link for you. Um, he can put you on to the right people and he can help you with design um, if you require that as well. So especially looking at makers, really. Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, question from Quinton. Um, I had to go with the Nutcrackers, which uh, really happy with. However, they use a lot of spray paint. And I was wondering if sanding the sealer first would help. And if you use a sanding sealer, can you still uh, spirit stain after? Okay, well, there's lots going on here. Certainly, if you want to use a spirit stain, don't sanding seal. They're designed to apply directly onto bare timber. What spirit stains are very good at is drying quickly without raising the grain. So that's the, a very uh, different thing than using a pallet wood dye, water-based wood dye, for instance, which would raise the grain. So if you're going to use spirit stain, no, don't apply a sanding sealer. If you want to apply a paint, um, then apply a sanding sealer. So the more, if you put a sanding sealer on, you're going to um, uh, minimize penetration from a top coat. So we don't use sanding sealer when we want to use stains. We don't use sanding sealer when we want to use oils. But in terms of paints and, and lacquers and things like that, absolutely sanding sealer first. Um, there is a make, Quinston, because I saw your question earlier, and um, Rust-Oleum um, does a fantastic paint uh, for wood, which is toy safe as well. And when we're doing anything like smokers, nutcrackers, um, all those sort of colorful um, um, pro uh, projects, they can almost appear as toys. So I think it's quite important that we use um, something that's that's toy safe or, or seen to be toy safe as well. So yes, Rust-Oleum. Okay, a uh, question from Darren. Um, I have some Hampshire Sheen Danish oil and I am wondering what's the best way to use it and get a nice shine, please? Right. Okay, Darren. What we're going to do is I've got a, um, a an already turned and sanded piece of timber that we're going to use an oil finish for. So later on, I want to be able to do an oil finish to a shine 
Um, we're going to use French polish, same thing. Um, I'm also going to do uh, a wax with a sanding sealer. So we're going to explore those for you in a minute. And it's a sanding process again with oil. Um, you go through a sanding um, uh, process to get to that nice shine. So we're going to look at that in a minute. Okay, great okay. stuff. Um, from Martin, um, with friction polish, what sort of speed should you use and how much heat should be generated to get an optimum shine? And also, now this didn't take long, could you please um, demonstrate your small signature skew? Okay, if you <laughs> ask so nicely. Um, no, right, okay. So several things. Um, uh, in terms of friction polish, again, we're going to do a little bit of friction polish in a minute. In terms of heat, I have no idea. Um, but we'll play around with the speeds. It's one of those things that I've never looked at. I've never looked at how fast works. Um, faster the better. Um, but there's a few little things that we need to consider when using friction polish. Um, we can use the sanding sealer underneath. Um, it's not always necessary, especially on denser timbers. Um, if you sand with an already damp tissue as opposed to cloth, um, it can draw that in. So you'll end up sticking bits of tissue to it. So again, we'll look at that in a moment. Um, and heat, like I said, I'm not sure about heat, but well, I'll tell you speeds. Diameter obviously is going to make a difference. And sa uh, friction polishes don't like being used on um, very large diameter pieces. So I would say once you get up to sort of four inches under a mil, possibly push five or six, but not more than that really, then they'll start to dry and drag. There's just too much content, too much solid in them. Um, so keep small. Um, and obviously the bigger you go, the slower you're going to go as well. So we'll explore in a moment. Uh, in terms of the skew chisel, yes, I just want to um, to sort of turn down and, and create a little cylinder that we can use that friction polish on. So we'll just look very briefly at the skew chisel, but the skew chisel gets a chance to be used most weeks anyway. We will look at that in greater depth later on, but we'll a little dabble today. Uh, just on skew chisels while we're, uh, while we're talking and thinking about it, um, is there anywhere in the US to purchase your skew chisels? Yeah, so there's numerous places in the US. Um, one of the best ones that I'd like to um, let you know about really is the Woodworking Store. Um, that's based in New York, they're mail order. Um, and again, Lily's got the link for you, so have a look at the link. Um, and that uh, basically it's a wood turning um, emporium. So you'll be able to get all your wood turning supplies, um, tools, and they're doing the Conway signature skews there for you. Okay, so back to finishes. Um, question from Bryn, any products that can stain various colors, dry very quickly, but is wipe on? Um, yeah, it was stain. Um, so this particular one is the chestnut one. Spirit stain, I would say more so. The thing with spirit stains, I've sort of touched on it already. Spirit stains, um, they dry quickly. So really, you're, you're turning within uh, about 20 seconds. If you apply them through an airbrush even sooner. Um, I have applied already, Ben, just popped a camera to a minute, buddy. Um, I have applied this black on here already. I just wanted, there was a, a previous question about um, layering color up. Um, and I wanted to go over that. So I wanted a black start to this. This is a piece of timber that I got with Ripple in it specifically for this demonstration. Don't worry about any of this overspray here. Um, but this has just been brushed on. You could wipe it on with a rag. The reason that I've done that instead of airbrushing, on, I need this base color to penetrate because it's going to be sanded off most of it. 90% it's coming back off again. And it's going to pick out the grain. Um, and I'll demonstrate that with some pictures in a moment. But it's going to pick out the grain. I'll sand most of it off, then apply color, or, or just leave it bare and apply a lacquer afterwards. So spirit stain, probably the best one. Um, dries really, really, really quickly. Um, and, um, and and like I say, it, uh, it, it, once it's hard, it can be sanded nicely. And brush on, um, rag on, anything you want, really. Okay, uh, question from Frankie. Not necessarily finishes, but um, uh, when would you use a detail gauge? They've got a kind of half-inch, three-eighths bowl gouge, but when would you use a detail gauge? A detail gouge is an extension to a spindle gouge, really. So detail gouge is exactly that. It's for that fine detail. If you imagine a marriage between a, a spindle gouge and a skew chisel, that's what you've got. It's a, a, a basically a skew... A, is on the brain it's basically a spindle gouge with a very acute angle and it gets you into that really fine detail mainly on spindles i have to say 
um, rarely used on bowls. Um, again, it could be used maybe to pick out a bead if you've got that on the top rim of a bowl, but safer to use on spindle turning. Um, so that would that would be why. It's just that literally the name says it all. It's for, for very fine detail, for cutting down into really fine bees, for, for precise beads. Okay. Okay. Right. We've still got a few more. Yep. Yeah. Coming far away. Q and A. That's what we're here for. Thank you guys. Um, not necessarily again. Um, finish related, but uh, still a good question. Uh, advice on the mask you use and its benefits. I'm thinking uh, the kind of air shield. The air shield. So yes, the JSP, the air shield. Um, so I use one of those all the time. There, there, there is a difference if you use a paper mask. Um, and, and certainly at the moment, a lot of us are wearing paper masks, but dust paper masks, um, they're okay for a limited amount of uses, a limited amount of, of jobs. Um, and as an everyday go-to mask, brilliantly, brilliant, but you will have to dispose of them after, um, well, supposedly every use um, or every couple of uses. The thing with your, um, your respirator is not only is it protecting me from dust, so it's pumping clean air, after the air has been filtered through the two filters, pumping clean air, but it also protects me from things um, flying from the lathe. So chips of, of shavings going in my eyes or anything worse than that. If something come off the lathe big and hit me, um, then all my pretty bits, my teeth, my chin, my nose, as well as my eyes would be protected. So that's really what that's for. Um, and the benefit with the one that I'm using, the JSP, is that... Um, it's light. I've used a lot of these masks before and they're really, really heavy, either because they've got a big battery pack on them um, or you're connected up to big battery packs. They're, they're light enough to, to wear. There's not a huge amount in the way, so you're not bumping your head all the time. But, and this has saved me once, after I, um, sweeping the floor, I was bending down. As I got up from underneath the band, so I caught my head on the corner of the table um, and I was wearing that mask. It's got a bump cap on the top and it saved my head. So I know from experience that, uh, that that works. So for me, that's the best one out there at the moment without spending a thousand pounds. Okay. Uh, and a question from Duncan this time. Um, what order do you apply? Sanding sealers, Yorkshire grit, oils, waxes, Hampshire sheen, beeswax, buffing with compounds, spit and polish? Um, if you play a... If you plan to use a stain, how do you prepare and finish afterwards? Well, you better stay and watch for the next hour or so because we're going to go over most of that for you. Um, the, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think when it comes to finishes and turning, it's as, as much of a minefield as sharpening can be and it causes as many questions. So that's why I want to try and go over as many things as possible. Um, like I say, we're starting with stain and we're going to move on to oils and things like that. So before we answer too many questions, is that, are we still got more? We still got more. We still got more. Well, go go on then. Okay. I'm going to answer your question. We're just going to cover it in practicals. Perfect. Um, what techniques do you use for painting and decorating the wood turned German smokers? And that's a question from Cliff. Right. Again, many answers possibly for that uh, question. Um, a lot of my basic smokers, or well, it's not basic smokers, a lot of the everyday smokers are done with an airbrush. The reason being that I want to show the timber through the color. So I'm using spirit stains again, and they're transparent. So you can actually see the grain coming through. And I think that's important with the style that I do. When it comes to things like nutcrackers, however, I want an opaque color. I want a solid body color. And, and they can be really, really bright, vivid colors. Um, so there I'm using more of a paint as opposed to a stain. Um, and it, it just gives me, like I say, a, a more more Christmassy decorative look rather than that, that slightly softer muted look that I'm getting through, through the stains. So um, Rust-Oleum, if you want solid color um, or some of the, the acrylics that we do, the craft polyvinyl acrylics, they're really good for solid color as well. Um, and if you're going to use those, sanding sealer first. Um, but like I said, for transparent, for spirit stains, no sanding sealer. They get um, sanded straight over. I wouldn't go too fine with your abrasive either. 400 is enough. Um, you don't want to create a glazed outer surface of the timber. The stain struggles to break that barrier if you do that. So about 400 grit. Um, but get rid of all the scratches, but just stop at about 400. 
Oh, one other thing while we're talking there. Now, we've done the smokers before Christmas, um, and there are instructions on the website there to to, um, to paint and to create those. And incidentally, if you enjoyed the, um, the fruit turning one um, a few weeks ago, get on there. There's more instructions. There's more plans, hard copies, and digital downloads. So have a look. All designed by Finway Designs again. Cheeky little plug in there. Okay, next question. Okay, we've got a question from Ian. On the basis that there is no silly question, well, almost, um, what finish would you use on an upright spinning wheel in oak? Okay, so we've got a still for this. Ben, pop that still up. So as an apprentice, this is the shop of um, of Jeffrey Manley's. Now, he's the guy that I've done my apprenticeship with. Um, and I used to make loads and loads of these spinning wheels, both upright and seated. Um, and we used a combination of things. Some of them were oiled. Some of them were French polished. Um, and, and sometimes a combination of the two. The ones that you're looking at at the moment are French polished. To make it easier for yourself, though, now, we don't need to use French polish uh, like we did back then. We tend uh, tend now to, to use wax polishes. They, they're they're nicer blend nowadays. So I would go for something like um, either an oil or a sanding sealer and a microcrystalline wax. Microcrystalline purely because they've got a water inhibitor in them. So under wear, um, fingerprints and things like that aren't going to deteriorate the... Um, uh, the finish for you. So either one of those really. Oil, make the, let the oil dry thoroughly before you re-oil um, or sandy cedar and, and wax polish. Thank you, Ben. Okay, uh, question from Paul. Um, will you cover food safe finishes, including the process before adding the food safe finish? For example, do you use a sanding sealer and then the finish afterwards? Food safe. Uh, food safe oil. So we're going to do an oil finish, but food safe oil is no different than, say, applying a finishing oil, applying a Danish oil, a lemon oil, walnut oil, tongue oil, any of those things. They're all done in the same way. You don't apply a sanding sealer before an oil. The job of oil is to penetrate the timber. The sanding sealer's job is to stop things penetrating the, the timber, okay, and seal that grain in. So we don't use the sanding sealer when we're going to oil. Um, yes, we're going to do an oil finish. The difference between food safe oil and regular, uh, what I would call finishing oils, food safe oil is completely um, uh, derived of any um, dryers. So it takes a little bit longer to dry. It's colorless. It's odorless. Um, um, and oh, it's obviously food safe. So for salad bowls, kitchen utensils, things like that, that's where I'd go with that. Um, if I want a slightly brighter finish, so a slightly shinier finish, then I might probably go more with a finishing oil or Danish oil. Just be aware they do have drying agents, and usually it's white spirit um, to help them dry a little bit quicker. Some of them have got UV protection in it as well. I think most Danish oils now do, um, and I think the new finishing oil does. So just be aware of that when you're putting it on on uh, salad bowls, that sort of thing. I feel that fruit bowls are fine with finishing oil because you're not serving wet food from it. You're, um, you know, it's usually dry food. So that's for me that I'm I'm happy doing that. Um, but yeah, that's all. We're going to do one of those in a minute. Okay. Hey, uh, another question from Paul. Um, when giving an item as a gift, what finish will be long lasting so the recipient doesn't have to resand and refinish in the future? Um, and, and, you know, because they've got, to, they've got to dust it and keep it clean and stuff. Yeah. Um, it really depends on the project. All timber, if it's left bare, regardless of the finish, eventually will discolor. Um, some finish was some finishes will minimize or sorry lengthen the time before they discolor but eventually it all will discolor um if we're using if we want a quick gift the item finish then so say for instance something like a little light pull or a bottle stop you've got to think about them being handled the the whole nature of what they are they're grabbed all the time they're handled especially something like a light pull that's going to be um uh, used in the in the bathroom so i would do something like an oil finish on that one um friction polishes are okay however friction polish will dull if it's used a lot so if it's handled a lot 
Um, so I would go on something like uh, something like a, an oil finish for that. In terms of bowl turning, um, let's go to one of the the mixed color bowls, Ben. The uh, the next one you've got up actually. I've, this this next slide here, there was still sorry. Um, I've put here for several reasons because I want it to support what I'm doing in a moment with um, uh, with this black rim um, little platter. But we had a question also about um, uh, stain bleeding through. Um, and so that was the reason that, that we've got that. But in terms of that being a gift, that's um, sealed and finished with an acrylic uh, lacquer. So a lacquer is a very long lasting finish. So it'll, it'll take all the handling that you want to give it, um, being passed around that sort of thing. Um, so lacquer for me is the best way. And whether you use a melamine lacquer or an, or an acrylic lacquer depends on you. Melamine can take a little bit um, uh, longer to set. So they'll set generally within about 28 days, dry within about an hour though. Um, or if you go to acrylics, they again, 20 minutes before they're um, ready to, to um, be recoated, usually good and dry again, properly set within about an hour so um gifty items those sorts of things and with both the lacquers um acrylic and uh, melamine you can either spray them on or you can brush them on thank you ben okay so we've got one more question and then we'll go over to some demonstrations okay oh. so a question from uh, frederick uh, I like a very light colored wood, but I find that a lot of finishes darken considerably. Is there a finish, either a wax or oil or a lacquer that, that doesn't darken? Right. Okay. If you think about, even if you put water on a timber, you're going to darken it. Um, when that water dries, it goes light again. The trouble is when you put a finish on, it sets, it doesn't, it doesn't evaporate. Um, that's why you're getting that color, that, that sort of darkening to the timber. So there's your experiment. If you put a little dab of water on, that's going to be the color that's left by any finish. Unless you uh, probably minimize that by using something like a neutral wax, but under a neutral wax, you have to have a sealer anyway. Um, and so you're going to get a little bit of darkening. Um, your best bet, probably I would lacquer. And this is a bold move, lacquer without sealer. So lacquer, allow the grain to rise, sand back. We're going to use the lacquer as a sealer. Then we're going to apply another coat, lacquer, very lightly denib, and then lacquer again. Generally, three to four coats of lacquer should do the job. Okay. Um, but that would be probably the palest way of doing it um, uh, that you could get. Okay. Um, but yeah, I know it's, 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 always been an issue but if you think about it just a little bit of uh, water rub that on the surface that will be the lightest color that you're going to get so and i know food safe oil is is water in appearance it's it's clear um there's no amber to it so uh, if it's an oil certainly food safe would probably be your best bet yeah we're all good right i'm sure there'll be a few more questions as we go so i've got quite a lot to get through today i've purposely planned this so um we can field as many questions as possible first one that i wanted to go over we had a little bit um of a question about layering color and i just wanted to show you why we would layer color because there's a very there's a big conversation that goes on when i demonstrate this sort of thing is why would you color timber it's already beautiful anyway and i would only do that to highlight grain structure um, or if it's a very bland color, you just fire through those um, images now, Ben, and I'll explain as we go. We've got a couple of ash bowls, a couple of sycamore bowls. Now, this is the sycamore bowl. Uh, the reason that I wanted to show you this one, this is the same bowl that has the, the pale inside, but to highlight the grain that we've got there, that ripples, sycamore doesn't show ripple that well when left bare. So what we've done here, and it's the the demonstration I'm about to do, we've got black base, which is sanded back 90%. Uh, so you're just highlight highlighting the, the softer areas. And then applied a very light blue over the top before the lacquer goes on. So it really sort of um, pushes that grain out, makes it more visible. Go to the, the top of that bowl, Ben. And in terms of um, bleeding, what I've done to, that's it, the, the, before I applied that lacquer is I sanding sealed the inside and top rim, then sanded the outside, and then applied the lacquer. So the sanding sealer was helping to barrier that stain, um, and it gives me that nice crisp um, finish. Bear in mind, something that's thin, 
um, or something that's extremely soft, stain will always penetrate and it will come through from the back. Okay, so just bear that in mind. That bar wasn't, it was only about, it was quite chunky, I suppose, about half an inch, 12 mil. Um, so there was no stain going to creep through there anyway. But the sanding sealer definitely helps. Remember what we said, no sanding sealer if you want to apply on um, the stain, but the sanding sealer will act as a barrier if you want to create a line. Thank you. Um, and then the two ash ones. So again, just working with stain and using this stain to create um, sort of more of a dramatic effect. Now, that's a, a piece of ash. Without the stain there, it, it's almost hidden, that grain. You can see it if you look closely. But this is um, a heavy base of black first, sanded back 90%, then red and then yellow on the top. The red was sanded back, again, equally as, as vigorously as the black. And then the yellow is just as a finishing coat. And you can mix your, whatever colors you want together. And you see how that just picks out that lovely grain of the timber. So it's emphasizing the, t the, the grain, not taking that, the, the grain away. And then the other side of that bowl, we've got a bit of crotch going on there. Very, very dense um, um, timber. But again, it's just picking out those soft areas, accentuating the, the, the grain structure. Um, yeah, not the best photograph. It's in the workshop just after that was done. But then that, again, sealed in with um, an acrylic um, uh, lacquer in this case. Lovely. Thank you, Ben. Perfect. I think that was all on those, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, the ripples. So oh, another another type of um, effect on timber, rippling. Rippling is, is beautiful. This is a bit of rippled ash, quite dense ash. But again, same issues there. I wanted the, the colour to emphasize the the rippling and make it really pronounced that's bare there's no um, lacquer on top of that so uh, i went with a satin lacquer after that just so it, it kept it woody and not looking too plasticky and i think sometimes if we buy too much gloss to to things they can get a little bit plasticky i didn't want that so there it's just using color to um to promote that that grain to show that grain now look i've done the black there i'm going to sand that back so we're going to start um, quite noisily with with a dust extractor and if you think about finishing finishing should not just be about your um, the polishes that you apply it's about sanding as well all i'm going to do first of all we're going to sand back 90 percent um with a rotary sander i'm going to use a hand rotary sander however power sanding is also a great way to go if you're if you've never done any power sanding you would have seen them before power sanders are basically one of these in a drill at speed. So we're not relying on rotation of the lathe. Um, and that's the most aggressive way. If you're into doing lots and lots of bowls, power sand is the easiest way uh, out of it. Um, I tend to use rotary sanders more often purely because I'm not making lots of bowls. The minute I go to lots of bowls, I'll get my power drill back out. But this is a, a slightly more sympathetic uh, way of sanding. 180 grit there. Dust extractors going on a minute. Play speed to zero, we turn the machine on. So we're going to sand back until that black is almost gone. I'm going to stop this periodically just to show you where we are with it. Just have a look and see what we've got so far. Now already, already, you can see what's happening. You can see the pale patches coming through. We've got a long way to go yet. We still got to take a lot more of that um, of that stain off. But in a minute, I'll apply the blue. And once you do that, you then replace that white um, with a color. You don't have to. You can apply a colored base coat, sand 90% back, and then apply your lacquer. Absolutely fine. Let's just carry on with that sanding though. I think we're nearly there obviously you can keep going you can do as much of this as you want to but look what that's done that's really started to bring that 
all the phyto and the dust extractor off. Let's just clean them. That's really started to bring the, the grain through. Okay, so look, what we can do now, we can apply a top coat. And in this case, if I apply the blue, um, and I'm going to airbrush this on. So we're going to use a, a little airbrush with a nice light colored blue, uh, a nice um, slow speed. And you don't have to. You can wipe this on with a rag. If you don't have an airbrush, don't worry about that. Just put it on with a rag. Don't forget, if you don't want it on in the middle or if you don't want it on the outside, sanding seal, then sand back. Okay, so we're starting to get that nice top coat now. I can go on, sand that back and reapply another coat, or we can go on with a different color. Um, but just very briefly, now we've got that happening. And this isn't going to be a finished piece. I'll sand this back and rework it, so don't worry. Let me just take away some of that muck. And again, beauty of airbrushes and applying um, stains with an airbrush is it's dry. You know, it's not, I don't have to worry about um, that wetness. Um, but there is no problems at all with applying with a rag or brush like the question earlier. Um, just get a give it a little bit more time to dry. I mean, what we do, you know, 30 seconds maybe to dry instead of 10, which is not a big deal in... in um, in the grand scheme of things, really. But there, I'm going to put the dust extractor on. I'm just going to give it a squirt of um, lacquer. In this case, we'll go with the gloss. And in this case, I've got the chestnut one. Now, today's demonstration is not about brand names. It's about types of finish. So I've got an awful lot of finishes here. A lot of them are chestnut. It's just what I've got in the cabinet. But, you know, we're talking... Um, in terms of brand-wise, I found them all very, very good, all very similar. Um, this is purely just a, a gloss acrylic. I'm going to put the speed down really, really low. Dust extraction on. I don't want to be taking the excess into my lungs, so dust extractor on. You want to be around about sort of 300 mils, so about just over the foot away. And this is where you'll get that that real glimmer, that shine come through. If I start moving that around, you'll start to get that little bounce as the light hits the it's the rippling. Now, you know, without that, you you just don't get that vividness there. You might want to just leave it to to the plain timber, but you can really get some nice patterns going if you start layering up colours. Um, so that's our first. Our first little demonstration. Don't forget, sanding sealer on the back to stop the overspray. Just being a little bit careful when you're applying with the brush, and that should help you. And I would sand that separately. So at this stage, apply the colour before you put the spray on. Give this a good sand. Make sure your lip is nice and, and clean of any um, of any of this stain here that's that's grabbed. And then then you put your your lacquer on over the top. All right, twenty minutes or so. That'll be dry and ready for the next coat. It's still tacky, but just a quick overhead there, Ben, it gives you an idea, very, very quick idea of what we can do quite quickly. Okay, so that's that one. Let's shove that one to one side. Um, and we're going to put on the lathe just a blank that I prepared earlier. I want to go now through a couple of types of finish. So have we got any questions before I count? Oh, yeah, we've got a few. Okay, we'll do a few questions while I'm changing over. Okay, so uh, the first question, we've got lots of questions, so what I think we'll do, Colin, if it works for you, we'll just do them in batches of four and five uh, through, your, through your demo. Sounds good. Great stuff. So, question from Martin. Uh, would you recommend cut and polish finishes? Yeah, cut and polish, um, your grit, all those sorts of things. So, they've got a suspended abrasive within the wax, and that does several things. Not only does it lubricate the um, the abrasive as it's as, as, as you're working it, but they're great to be applied over things. So applied over a sanding sealer, applied over a lacquer, that sort of stuff. It's almost like a final a final polishing. 
Um, so absolutely recommend those. They give you a nice gloss um, finish. Um, like I say, especially over things like lacquers are really, really good. Yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, can you recommend a durable finish which isn't shiny? I like wood to look like wood. Yeah. Food okay. safe version of this as well? Uh, yeah, again, the re you have to research that. Look for the, the either the food safe logo or toy safe logo. It depends on your use. Toy safe means um, basically they've been tested for heavy metals. If a kitty picks them up, puts them in the mouth, literally puts them in the mouth, um, once dry, they won't be harmed. That's a, a version of, uh, of what Toy Safe stands for. Um, in terms of Food Safe, now Food Safe is going to be used with wet foods, very, very similar thing to Toy Safe. However, um, you're going to be using uh, wet oils or wet Food Safe oils, for instance, on salad bowls often. So if you do get a little bit of that ingested, again, it has to be absolutely safe for you. Um, in terms of um, a hard finish and and still being food safe, I would struggle with that, I'll be honest, because my first instance would be to go with a lacquer. Um, now, I know the cans of acrylic gloss lacquer do state toy safe. They don't state food safe. So I think you'd have to contact the manufacturer just to discuss that if you wanted it to be food safe. Um, but any of the lacquers, um, gloss, obviously, you don't want satin pretty good but then if you wanted to to make it even i don't want to say the word dull i don't mean that i mean m more um more of a matte finish more the timber finish i suppose then you could very fine uh, web racks or my least favorite thing of all um wire wool the finest you can get just to very lightly denib that back and i would go over something like that as opposed to a, a sandpaper or an abrasive um, in terms of a material abrasive, because they create lines where your your web racks and uh, the wire walls wouldn't do that, um, even if you just sand it off the lathe, you know, with with some wire wall that sort of thing. You'll just take the sheen back a little bit, um, or any of the flat finishes that you can get. A flat finish is going to keep it as close to the timber as you can you can get. And when I say flat finish, I mean that's what they're called flat finish. It's like a mat almost. Okay. Okay, uh, from Fam, uh, question. Any advice on how to use melamine lacquer? Uh, tried using burnishing cream afterwards after it's cured, but seemed to take it all off despite three coats. Um, I doubt whether it took it off. It might have dulled the surface a little bit. Melamine lacquer will take a long time to cure. So drying and curing are different things. So drying... To be able to hand to be able to handle it or to be able to recoat with melamine should should be quite quick, um, but curing generally is a matter of a few days or a few a couple of weeks in most cases. So I would I would say you need to give it plenty of time before you use burnishing cream. Burnishing cream or what like we've just discussed, cut and polish, um, anything like that will, will just lift it a little bit. Um, but I shouldn't take it off, certainly, and especially with free coats, definitely not. Um, if you get any problems with that, again, contact um, manufacturers just to see if they can give you any pointers. Oh, another question then um, from Jennifer. Uh, question, is it realistic to expect when buying woodwork, uh, uh, turning blanks online that they should be woodworm free? Is it realistic? Yeah. I wouldn't expect woodworm. I'm probably setting myself up for a fall here, but yeah, absolutely. Unless, unless now woodworm, beetle, um, beetle larvae, that sort of thing, they can be all be very different. And if you have something like ambrosia maple, it's got a worm in it. That's that's where it gets its name from. The ambrosia beetle, the larvae from that creates those lovely patterns. So that I'd expect it to. Otherwise, um, I'd have a problem with buying it if it didn't. Woodworm, what we would what I call woodworm, no, I wouldn't expect a blank to, to have in it. Um, but make sure that it is woodworm, um, because you will find the odd hole here and there. They're not necessarily live woodworm in it, no. Question from Steve. Uh, what is the best option to finish cereal bowls frequently used? It's almost almost as difficult to answer that as, as if you asked what's the best thing to finish a wine goblet? Because they're really, really tricky things. It's just, 
you got a, um, a solution in, you know, a liquid in in that in that bowl. Uh, I would say, f- if I was doing it, I would probably epoxy. You'd have to double check with the um, again the manufacturers to make sure the epoxy once set um, is stable. That's one thing I would double check. Um, if you look at some of the, um, we were only talking about this before um, I started today. Um, whiskey goblet makers they use the old the, the same technique of heating of burning as um, the guys that make uh, whiskey barrels and wine barrels, where you heat it. Um, to such a, an extent that it creates that waterproof in, interior. Uh, you wouldn't do that with a bulb because you, it's a different orientation of grain completely. Um, so I would say uh, lacquer, epoxy, um, speak to manufacturer and make sure that they are stable once dry. Um, and the same with wine goblets and things like that. Oils just won't work because oils, they breathe. And so uh, certainly um you'll find a, a nice oil slick on the top of your milk uh, when you're having your cereals and if it's wine they're acidic and it will strip that that oil away so it has to be something that creates a complete barrier okay um one more question uh, from callum this time i've um, been using yorkshire grit is it okay to use friction polish after um yeah there's, there's no reason why not i don't i'm guessing because you want to have a, a higher shine um they they battle with each other a little bit. Your sugar is gonna is like an abrasive; it's suspended in the wax, so that's gonna give you a nice high shine. Um, and then you're just then gonna put a similar sort of product, but a non-abrasive one over the top of that. So I probably wouldn't use them together. Not gonna hurt each other, but I probably wouldn't. I would just go with sanding if you want a really high shine sanding sealer and um, uh, and your friction polish. If you're looking to get that final sanding with Yorkshire grit then no problem yorkshire grit then sanding sea you're going to be, you're going to be fine with it incidentally one thing i never said earlier when it comes to um using cut and polish yorkshire grit those sorts of things they do work much better on on denser materials if you're using them on very soft materials the sometimes you can um discolor um i found it the it, the the abrasiveness just just penetrates the wax too far in if that makes any sense so uh, the harder material the better they t- they tend to work okay all right for a, for a minute okay so well i think we're going to start with a sanding sealer now i want a sanding seal and then a wax polish on this one um just to show you the difference i want to open up a bit of discussion on wax waxes so in terms of sanding sealer let's talk sanding sealers first again i've just got this one as an instance this one is the cellulose sinner by the cellulose sanding sealer by chestnut or shellac sanding sealer um, you can get pre-thin. There's another one. This is a Hampshire sheen. So this is a pre-thin sanding sealer. And in terms of um, sanding sealers, um, there are quite a variety. So the one I prefer is cellulose. We dilute the cellulose here um, quite aggressively. It can be anything sort of 50, um, 50% uh, thinners. Um, but between about 30 and 50 percent thinners um, that makes it really really liquid um, it soaks in a long way penetrates the grain uh, but it dries so quickly literally within about 20 seconds 30 seconds you're ready to go um, and if you've never used sanding sealer before sanding sealer is designed to penetrate in to lock the grain in position so remember what we we're saying about what finish we apply afterwards if we apply a, um, a stain it's not going to penetrate if you apply an oil, it's not going to penetrate, so it can't, they can't do their job. So it's not right for those. But if you want to apply a polish or a lacquer or a friction polish, those sorts of things where you want a high build shine, it's quite important. It's same with waxes. If you just apply wax on bare timber, fantastic. It'll look great to start with. But then with the humidity, the different um, atmospheric conditions, those fibers will start to stand up. And Yes, they can become rough, but also that shine from the wax will disappear quite quickly. So that's why we use a sanding sealer before a wax polish most of the time. Um, unless you're using something like a, a decorative um, wax polish where you want it to penetrate grain, um, I would always use sanding sealer before. Cellular is my favorite because of its speed of drying. Really, really, really quick. You then got spirit sanding sealers, so shellac, that sort of thing. And they're based on the old French polished 
um, design. They've got a lot of shellac in them. Um, you can go for acrylic. Acrylic's water base is probably the longest taking to dry. Well, that's about an hour. Um, the shellac, the spirit stain, uh, spirit um, sanding sealer. Um, acrylics are water based. Anything water based is going to take a long time to dry. Um, and then you're talking a couple of hours before it's properly ready to put another um, a type of finish on top. So for us turners, I would go with either one of those two, um, um, shellac, spirit, or cellulose. Um, it's got cellulose thin as that. I didn't mean to pick that one up. Cellulose, um, there we are, sanding sealer, sorry. All right, so we dilute it with thinners, but it's cellulose sealer. Um, I keep my cellulose sealer in a glass jar it doesn't like polystyrene it doesn't like plastic well I say, I say it doesn't like plastic yes it does like plastic you can put it in certain plastics i'm not clever enough to know what plastics i can put it in and which i can't so it's a bit of a lottery so glass jar and a brush which isn't painted on the inside if you have a painted brush or plastic handle brush um, then you're going to have a horrible mess in the inside of your sanding sealer um, so just get ready for that. I'm diluted here about 70% um, uh, sealer and about 30% of, uh, of thinners. Um, the Hamster Sheen one there has already comes pre-thinned, all ready to go. Okay, so that was, that will start you off. Um, I know it'll probably get me into a fair bit of trouble, but the manufacturer um, does say that you, you don't have to thin it. And it, they're dead right. You don't have to thin it. If you've got a very punky timber, then don't. Just apply it. Let it let it soak in nice and thick. Um, but I want to crack on very quickly. I want it to penetrate through very dense timbers and also oily ones, things like, um, things like teak, like olive, um, chestnut, all those those timbers that have a real um, sort of waxy oiliness to them, th that cellulose will penetrate through. Water base won't do that. Okay, so it's quite good to, to use something like that here. Um, on this piece, Ben, pop to camera two a minute. Now, this is a really, really pretty piece of oak. You can see the medullary rays there glint, sort of glistening away. What we're going to do is put a sanding sealer on that first. The sanding sealer is going to raise the grain slightly, raise the nap. Um, and we're then going to very lightly sand that back and apply our wax polish. So get a little bit of rag ready, and I would place it underneath the lathe. Dust extractor is not on, so that's safe. Um, and we're just going to apply all over to saturation without the lathe running. You don't want this airborne. You certainly don't want this in your face. It's not good. Okay, so I'm wiping it on so it's fully covered. And then wipe off the excess. So what I don't want to do is like the same with most finishes. If you leave them to pull on the surface, they stay sticky. Okay, we don't want that. It's already soaked in far enough. I'm allowing that now to dry. I, could, I know it's drying because it, I can smell it in the air. And that's those thinners doing their job. Um, so that's the sealer. I literally wait for... 20 to 30 seconds and then we're going to very lightly sand back with a fine abrasive at slow speed so there's 600 grit abrasive this one okay and just check the surface you can you can tell sometimes if, if it feels cold to the touch you've still got a little bit of of dampness and think about your timber as a very big dense sponge it will take sanding sealer and oils in if you turn the lathe on really really fast it'll shoot them back out again, generally in your direction. Okay, so we want to let that just dry a little bit. That's that's lovely grain there. So what I'll do, nice slow speed and a very gentle touch. Just a very, very gentle touch. The other thing, don't worry at this stage if you've got any fine scratches from your abrasive. It's not important because the next, it's only the sealer that you're scratching. The next, you're not doing the, you're not scratching the timber. The next coat of whatever finish you want to put on there um, will we'll get rid of those. Okay, so now we've got a choice what wax to use. There are masses and masses of waxes out there cut and polish was one so that's one that we've mentioned earlier that cut and polish like um, Hampshire Sheen is a not Hampshire Sheen uh, Yorkshire grit 
um, has an abrasive suspended, so that would do a little bit more sanding. But again, a bright finish. We've got, let me just talk. I'm going to talk, this is a good example. I'm going to talk Hampshire Sheen just, just briefly. So I'm going to talk make because I, within those make, this one make, I can show you several different um, waxes here. So we've got original, we've got the Michael Crystalline, and we've got high gloss. Original is going to give us that wood look that, that the question earlier was all about. Um, nice, well, all of them really, really nice to use. Um, but original would look like, would like wood. More look like wood. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, microcrystalline, available. Everyone does a microcrystalline. Microcrystalline is that uh, that water inhibitor. So if things are going to be handled a lot more than 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 something else, then that's the one you go for. Microcrystalline wax, a little bit more resistant um, to handling. A high gloss, got loads and loads of uh, carnauba wax in it. So gives you the highest shine that you're going to get from your wax. So that, that would be my choice. Um, if I'm doing a, a, a course, um, when I could do courses, um, most people will go with the high gloss one. They wanted a higher shine to them. Um, but absolutely understand that, you know, keeping the timber looking like timber, um, that would be your, your natural choice. Okay, so all loads and loads to choose from. Not only do you get different um, types um, of wax, so microcrystalline and clear, not only do you get that, but you also get different colors. So you can get wood colors. You can get clear generally is slightly yellow. Neutral is slightly white. And for me, if you want to, going back to a previous question, to create as non-yellowing surface as possible, go for neutral. So if you wanted to, to put a wax on something like a sycamore or a holly, something that's really pale, neutral is the best one. However, neutral will be seen in the grain of something like wenge or, or walnut, those sorts of things. So that's where you'd want to use a clear wax, something that wouldn't be shown up in the grain so much. Um, so those are the reasons for using the different ones. Um, I don't know what I'm going to use. Let's go microcrystalline restoration wax restoration wax really because um we're talking about handling the piece so restoration wax where usually you'll find that things have gone a little bit tired because they've been handled too much basically um that will help with that extra handling of them so i'm just going to apply this wax now um we're going to do it with a piece of tissue and again without the lathe moving I don't want the wax to skip over the deep grain within this oak. I want it to penetrate deep. So for that reason, I'm going to do the best bit of, of finishing and actually get my hands on the timber and watch the color change as well. So I really want to get that to penetrate in. If you had time, after you put the wax on, go and have a cup of tea. That's probably the best thing. I never do that. I tend to put the wax on or all the finishes and then crack straight on with finishing the project but you know a few seconds or minutes even will really help to start to set that wax make sure that's fully in there okay let's pop that just to one side a moment so that's covered we're now going to burnish so burnishing can be done with shavings and i've tied it up before not thinking about what we were going to be doing today so instead of burnishing with shavings, I'm going to go straight to tissue. Normally, my process is burnish with shavings and then buff with a piece of tissue, um, but we can crack straight on here. So are we going to pick that up? Do I need to add an extra light a minute? Ben, tell me if this if this is too much light um, because it's nice to see this shining. Or does it do anything? It probably doesn't do that much, does it? There we are. That's, that's what we wanted to see. Proper job. Right then, so lay speed to zero, turn the machine on, and then slowly raise the speed. And all I'm going to do is just be firm. And we're going to take away all the excess. Now go to a, a drier piece. Same thing again. Let's get a bit more speed. Um, I'm up to a thousand revs there. You can go faster if you want to, as long as it's safe to do so. There we are. 
And that's your restoration wax. That's the difference. You, you can see the shine that comes through that timber. Wait for the, the medullary erase. There they are. Okay. And that gives you a nice sort of satiny finish. We'll put the overhead camera on that in a moment. But that's a very, very easy one um, to start with. If you've just started out and turning and you want an easy finish, you're not going to get much easier than a wax for your bigger pieces, a friction polish, and an oil. They're a good trio of waxes to use, of uh, uh, finishes to use. Just on the overhead. I just want to try and grab. You see the, the grain is still coming through. Oak naturally is quite a... Uh, a porous timber you can see lots of structure within the timber and the wax hasn't hidden that which is another nice part of it so there we are that's our first one so that's a sanding sealer and and our wax we'll go on to an equally nice piece of oak this has got the sap put in one side still so you get a really nice transition there and what should we use next? I'll tell you what we're going to do is we're going to use an oil. So I've already got a cup of oil. Oh, questions. Questions before we carry on. Yes, Craig. Right. So we've got another batch of questions, please, Colwyn. Uh, Bill has said he's been turning a lot of uh, oak pieces, um, quite old, which has some big pores. He's been using grain filler, which works. Um, but is there an alternative? Um, it works. Well, it was this flat work, so furniture as opposed to turning. Doesn't say. If it's turning, then oil finishing creates its own grain filler, and it, and it's something that I'm just about to demonstrate now. Um, grain filler, uh, brilliant. No problem with grain filler at all. Apart from you will see grain filler in a you know with certain finishes. Um, I prefer to fill the grain by raising the nap and using the mixture, in this case, of oil and the dust to fill everything up nicely. Um, and the wax, even, that we've just used, you can see the pores are open there. There was no one uh, sort of smooth, plasticky surface. You could see the, the timber through it. That's what most people want. If you wanted to hide that, if you wanted a level surface, so if you're talking countertops, then epoxy it um, or lacquer it. That would be the best way. But this way, instead of using your grain filler, this will fill the grain naturally with its own dust. Hope that, that answered that okay. Sounds good. Ken has asked, aluminium oxide or silicon carbide sandpaper? Um, I tend to go aluminium oxide most of the time. It seems to be the ones that are made more for wood turners. Um, aluminium oxide, am I right in saying, is the RB paper? Am I right or wrong? It is, yeah. yeah. So the RB paper, which is uh, <laughs> boasting the ultimate abrasive, this stuff, but I'd use this all the time. It's flexible. It can be used with water, with oil, all those sorts of things. Um, even my sanding discs are, are aluminum oxide. Um, it just, just for me, it's the way to go and avoid paperback abrasives on the lathe. They just don't last very long at all. Um, the grip will, the, the, the actual abrasive part will be, will be great but that'll be on the floor because your paper has broken down and released the the actual abrasive okay. so we've had a, a couple of questions along the similar sort of lines here looking at the, the bowl that you did originally there was a little bit of bleeding in yeah um and, and particularly in end grain do you find that you know it bleeds into the end grain how do you stop and prevent that just pop the overhead cam on Right, okay. So this bleeding, um, th well, this is rather than bleeding, this is actually overspill because I was a bit lax on putting this on. But where, if you want to stop bleeding, you sanding seal. So the back of this has been sealed with sanding sealer. And so you get that nice crisp line. Um, ben, sorry, uh, could you go back to that bowl with the, the white um, inner surface? And um, this is the bowl, that, the one that I showed earlier. Sanding seal the surfaces you don't want any bleeding on. Um, and that will really help you. So that bowl was um, sanding sealed on the inside top rim um, and then the outside sanded and then the, the, um, the stain applied um, afterwards. Um, and that helped stop as much of the, the bleeding that, that, that I could have. This, sorry, bend back to the overhead. Um, this here is overspill from me being a little bit too aggressive with the brush because and this won't, this isn't finished. I've got to sand this back and restart this to get rid of that. I would sanding seal the inside first 
um, a little bit more careful how I apply, um, just like I was on the outside edge there, and that won't happen. Okay, so sanding sealer is your barrier. Okay, uh, airbrush questions. When spraying an alcohol dye, um, do what's the end of day cleanup process? Do you have to disassemble, uh, and so, or is it just okay to spray through a couple of cups of alcohol? Um, so, if you were talking the same sort of the type of spirit that I'm using, so I'm the the stains that I'm using can be um, diluted with either meths or cellulose, and for me, I leave that suspended in my airbrushes sometimes sometimes eight to nine months because i'm using them frequently um if it's if it's alcohol stay i've never i don't I, i'm guessing that you mean the same thing i'm using um then that's fine absolutely the time to clean your airbrushes is if you're using an acrylic so a true airbrush paint um they're, they're again they're water-based um, and they will need to be cleaned out after every use. Yes, sometimes they need to be cleaned out during use. So if you're spraying for a long time, a couple of hours, you might think you might find that you have to just give them a clean before you carry on because they'll be starting to dry, especially if where you're living is particularly hot or in the UK, if in summertime, when you if you use them in a hot workshop, that sort of thing, then yeah, absolutely, you need to keep them clean. Question from Paul. Um, Paul's in the understanding that you is poisonous until finished. What's the best finish uh, to use on you? Seal it completely is the best thing. Depends on, again, depends on what you're, you're, you're using it for. Um, there's certain things I wouldn't use you for. Salad bowls are an obvious one. Um, kitchen utensils are obvious ones. Some people are more allergic to you than others. Some people are very, very um, allergic to it. It can be extremely harmful to them. So that is the case of just don't use the stuff. Um, and fortunately it doesn't affect me at all. So I use it quite often in things like jewelry, um, in apples and pears that works really nicely. Um, I have used it before in a salt and pepper grinder. Um, but for the inside of that, and in fact, the outside of that, I'd epoxied it. Um, so it was completely sealed and, and, and had no problems at all. Um, the dust is the allergen. So that's where people, um, when you create the dust, if you're allergic to you, that's when you're going to get really badly hit. Um, so yeah, just, you need to seal it completely. Michael's asked, uh, he's looking to upgrade his lathe. Great news. Um, what would you recommend as a good all rounder? Depends what level you want and what you're allowed to buy. Um, this is the one that I've got at home. This is the, um, the, the, the 406, so the 8406 WL. This does everything I want it to. Um, this is probably, for me, the best lathe I've ever owned. And I'm not just saying that. That is uh, honest truth. Um, because it does everything I want, We I used to know it as a 1628 in old money, 16 inches, 28 inches. Okay, now it's a 406, it's got metric. Um, so that gives you an idea of what the sort of size you can you can do on it. The other thing I would say with this one is if you want to go bigger, and I've done three foot tabletops on this one before, purely by moving it to the end, it has a sub base that you can put on here, which then increases the, the size that you can turn on it massively. Um, it has um, good indexing, and if you've seen any previous demos for the Christmas um, decorations we've been doing, we've been using indexing quite a lot, um, and I like that facility of 36 indexing positions. It's got two belt speeds. Um, with 90% I'm using the high range, um, but it's got a really nice remote variable speed on it as well. So if, it, if it's that sort of size machine you're after and that um, this sort of price band, than this one. If you're th thinking craft machine, um, then we do the, the figures. Um, uh, um, I can't remember what the names of them are called. So the floor standing craft mechanically variable speed machine. We're just going to look and put a few links up for you. If you're looking for a big craft machine, I can't think of anyone better than that because there's not a lot to go wrong with them. They're a mechanically variable speed, so you still get the variable speed. Massive length between centers, 1100, um, and I think it's a 14-inch bowl capacity on that one as well. Um, and then the 355 if you're looking for a bench top machine. So the AC355, again, the, the one of the best bench top, um, or the best 
bench top craft machine that we do big um uh, bowl capacity for a craft machine it's got a grown-up thread size it's a 33 by 3.5 it's got a big stem on the tool rest so it's got all the all the attributes of a big machine a floor standing machine but on a bench top lathe so there's three um options for you there depending on how much you want to spend um, I would say um, if you go to a trade machine, so anything gray, um, a machine of this size, you do get a much um, a, a stronger motor, so a more torquey motor, you get better finish because more money has been spent on the manufacturer. It's, just, it's as simple as that. More money uh, spent in the making of the machine gives you a better build quality, um, means that you can use them for longer and you can throw more projects at it, bigger more welly at it, give it more abuse. And I give my uh, lathe abuse on a, a daily basis, and I'm not exaggerating, seven days a week. Okay. Any, any more? Yeah, we've got quite a few more questions. Uh, Kevin has uh, uh, commented. Um, Terry, our good friend at Chestnut, yes, know him well, yeah. uh, is adamant that cellulose sanding sealer should not be diluted in any way. What's your thoughts on this? In which case, if I was demonstrating for Terry or in front of him, I wouldn't use, I wouldn't dilute it in any way. My preference, um, uh, hoping that Terry's not watching this, my preference and experience um, makes me dilute it every single time for the reasons that I've said. It penetrates better, um, especially on denser timbers. Um, leave it undiluted if you're using soft timbers. Absolutely fine but I prefer to use it diluted on denser timbers. That's my preference. I'll get a phone so, call in a minute from Terry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll have a chat with Terry later. <laughs> um, so Warren has a question. What would you recommend to seal wood prior to doing uh, an epoxy pour? Good question. Epoxy. That's, that's the thing. So you seal it with epoxy. Um, in fact, I was just doing one um, last week. So you make sure your mold's done, absolutely um, watertight. You've fixed your pieces of timber down. You mix up your first batch of epoxy that's enough epoxy just to cover all of the timber um, and the void, so the bottom of the, the mold, basically. You can brush that on. So once you've vacuumed out all of the debris from the timber, brush on your first layer of epoxy. Depending on your epoxy, um generally overnight but just depending on which one it is will depend on how long that will dry and it's just you want it to go tacky um, before you apply your next coat that will stop those air bubbles coming up that that you which is the reason you seal um your, your table or your piece of work turning for so a seal with epoxy then pour in your next layer question from chris it's been extremely cold recently will my waxes be damaged by the cold um i haven't known waxes to get damaged obviously depending on where you are if you're in alaska and it goes down to minus 20 i don't know about that um but certainly um i would say reasonable temperatures most workshops i doubt will go that far below freezing um they should be okay um there's certain exceptions, things like PVA glues um, and any of your water-based finishes. If they drop below that that freezing point, then they will be damaged. Yes, um, so it, you need to need to get them uh, slightly warmer um, in a warmer area that that doesn't freeze. Certainly, in terms of um, uh, the oils, I found no issues. Waxes, I've found no issues with at all. The, the one thing that does happen with waxes when they get cold is they get really hard to use because they go very, very hard. In the summer, or sorry, in the warmer conditions, um, you'll find them very easy to, to, to apply. But you know, the colder they get, the harder. It's just like butter, I suppose, the harder they get. Yes. Okay. I think... Oh, we've got another couple. Um, will you be doing anything on uh, CA glue finishes, please? Now, CA glue finish is not something that I've ever done before, but yes, I'm going to experiment. We've done plenty of things for these demonstrations that I've never done. So I have been looking at a few online videos myself. And yes, I think there's something we ought to explore a little bit. And again, we'll learn together. Uh, um, it's an important part of turning. And a lot of people, especially pen makers, are using that type of finish. So I think it's a good idea to, to, to play with. I won't have a date yet. Um, but yes, we will do something with CA finishing, yeah. 
And what do you think of finishes from Osmo? Osmo, fantastic. Um, my floor's done with an Osmo finish. I um, also done my um, local pub's floor with Osmo finish. Um, all my uh, my doors uh, are done with Osmo finish. Coffee table's done with Osmo finish. Um, yeah, brilliant stuff. Absolutely first class finish. You're not going to get much better than that. All right, okay, good. Right, oil. I don't have an I don't have an Osmo oil to finish. It takes a little bit longer to dry than we have here. But look, I've got a couple of oils. I've got um, a finishing oil, uh, or two finishing oils. One by Libron, one by Chestnut. Um, I've already explained. I don't have a preference. They both work really, really well. They're both class, top quality um, oils. Um, but what I wanted to get from that is that they will they will both be applied in the same way um, to give the same results. So I'm going to apply them wet and wet sand. So we pop pop them out the way. And incidentally, the food safe oil would be exactly the same thing. You apply this in, in an identical way. You've got to be fairly um, careful with lathe speeds here because we're going to wet sand this. So that means it's going to be actually liquid when we're turning the lathe on. So if your lathe isn't electronically variable, um, you'll need to prep your lathe and get it down as low as it possibly can go. If it's much above 300 revs, don't do this because you will get covered. Um, this has to be, I usually start around about 150. So again, I might just turn the light on so you can see how wet that is, if it works, without going too glary. But that's a really, really wet finish at the moment, much more than that, and it's going to be dripping off the end um, edge of that timber. So what we'll do is we're going to sand now with 600 grit abrasive at very, very low speed. And what I want to happen here is for that to start drying, being absorbed into the timber. And the minute it does, I'm going to feel that pulling on the abrasive. Once that happens, I can start just raising the timber a little, sorry, raising the speed a little bit. It's already starting to be absorbed. And what's happening, the, the, the dust that's coming off is mixing with the oil and filling the grain. So what we get is um, the nap rising, that's going, the dust that's created filling the grain. So you get a very silky feel to the timber at the end of it, a really, really tactile finish. And if you're going to sell your work or, or certainly going to give it away, then that's really important. Get people to, to hold it, to pick it up, to feel the, the surface. And that generally is the clincher. Okay, we're getting there now. Oh, we keep going, keep going until you get a real good drag going. Let me just, we've got a little bit of overspill on the outside edge. Before I get that in the face, I'm just going to wipe it off. So now we're getting a good drag. So that's it. We're getting a real, so you won't see it, but there's a, a real brown, a real brown sort of paste, a mixture of, a mixture of um, dust and oil. Now I'm just going to slightly raise the speed because what I'll do now, I've got a handful of shavings down here. They're not ideal shavings to for burnishing. I like to use the wiry shavings as opposed to chips. But we're going to make do with this because I've got no others. Um, lay speed will start to go out. I'm producing heat now. So I'm pushing against the surface. I'm sort of helping, helping that to, to start setting, to start drying, getting that heat in. And that's also taking away all the excess. What I'll do now, all right, all the excess is just coming away. What I'll do now is just buff that up with a little, little tissue. Get a little bit of clean tissue. A little bit of clean tissue just to buff. And this will give us a satin finish. What I would do after that, and you need to leave this if you want to recoat it, you can't wait an hour, you've got to wait around about 24. Give it a day. 24 hours, give it a day, and then you go back to that with a very, very light coat of oil. 
and do what I've just done again, just with the, the shavings and the tissue and create um, another surface. Wait another 24 hours, do the same thing. And you can build this up almost like French polish to have a glass-like finish if you want it to, to be like that. If you don't, then stop where you're happiest. But that will give you a really tough, uh, resistant finish. And we're going to go to overhead cam again in a minute just to show you what that will look like um however you're doing a bowl and you've done this on the outside of the bowl you can carry on and finish the inside just expect a little bit of bleeding to come out when you do when you've done the inside and then just go back and refinish Look, again a really nice finish um, and that before i put the oil on was sanded down to 400 grit so i didn't need to go any finer than that and we're getting that beautiful um texture that 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 structure of the grain coming through still all right so that's the oil finish that was um a finishing a finishing oil um but food safe oil will work the same let me do i'm going to do this bit of elm now oh a few more questions yeah i've got a few more questions uh, design and make has asked uh, what finish would you use on wet timber if you're rough turning or do you not need to don't use any uh, well if you're if you're rough turning, you want to put something on it to help in the drying process to help stop splitting, then a PVA is the best thing. You can get building um, uh, cement additive, so you can get that in big five litre drums, uh, PVA cement additive, um, mix it with water in a bucket and brush it on the end grain. That's the best thing to do. Um, I used to say old paint and things like that, but it does get a little bit messy. Anything to seal the end grain works. If you're thinking about a finish finish, the trouble with doing that on anything wet is it won't last very long um, because of the moisture that's in there. Um, and also, if you're using timbers like ash, the minute you turn them, they, they react um, and oxidize and go pink, which you need, really need to sand away before, you're, uh, before you finish the piece. I recommend rough turning, leaving to dry, then returning. Um, that'll give you the best finish. If you want to turn a finished piece from wet, then you're going to have to do a little bit of hand sanding once it's dried. So um, during the shape, uh, aggressively sand with the coarser grades. Um, that will start the drying process quite nicely. And when it's finally dry a few weeks later, then go back to hand sanding, maybe some power sanding with a soft sanding pad, that sort of thing. Um, and then apply your polish or whatever um, uh, finish you want to put on it. <laughs> uh, question from Gerald, not a turning related um, finish question, but um, still a good one. Um, heat resistance, a cabinet not turned, mahogany TV unit finished with two coats of Danish oil and then two coats of wax. Slight heat from a sound bar has uh, left a slight mark. Is yeah. there an alternative finish? Uh, yeah, there is. You, you, uh, again, most purists won't like it because you're faced with... Um, going down the the lacquer or epoxy route but even then lacquers and epoxies react badly from very hot things so if you're putting a, a, a freshly made cup of tea or coffee on on any surface it will raise um raise the the, the surface if you want something you need again the you know you can put hot things on you're going to have to speak to manufacturers i would still say epoxy um, and but it's the type of, of epoxy you use. I've experimented with a couple, um, and like I say, hot cups um, do raise it a little bit. Um, but no, French polished waxes, oils, they will all react to heat in some way, unfortunately. So you're going to have to look at the, the, uh, the lacquer or the epoxy route. And Neil's commented, um, when dry sanding, he sees some people use an air gun to remove the dust from the grain, but with wet sanding, the dust is kind of left in the grain. Is that just a personal preference thing? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so what you'll get, we were talking earlier about um, a grain filler. That's what wet sanding is doing. It's making that slurry and it's filling the grain, um, filling the, the, the pores up. And so you get a different feel to the piece. I would say removing of, of dust if you're then going to apply a lacquer or something like that over the top, but that would be, then be sanded back and several coats applied, so you don't need to worry about the the grain filling so much. Um, the, the the grain filling is done with the with a wet finish because that is the final finish. That's that's the only reason. Okay. Um, 
question here. If I'm laminating wood into bowl blanks, what adhesive do you recommend? I've always used, uh, personally, I've always used um, a PVA. I've used the Type 1 2 PVA, but a lot of people use uh, polyurethane as well. Um, both of those glues, if done properly, will be sound. But you do have to make those precautions. You have to make sure all the surfaces are clean, dry, usual things, you know, read the back back of your um, adhesive, clean and dry, clamped well for long enough. Um, so you won't be able to to um, glue up the, your bowl blank in one hit. You're going to have to do a couple of joints, leave them, plane them back, then next bit and so on um, before you move on. And also make sure the timbers that you're using will work with a water-based um, or even polyurethane um, glue. If you're using things like olive and um, teak, where they've got a lot of, of wax and oil in, they could be a weak point. So do be a little bit careful with things like that. You might have to just wipe the surface with some either some cellulose or some um, um, meths just to make sure that a lot of that oil and wax is gone. You've got to take every precaution. Uh, you don't want that bowl explode, it's exploding halfway through. Okay. Uh, a question from Chris. Will building up the layers of finishing oil work on ash, cherry, and sycamore? Yes, absolutely will. Uh, building up layers work on um, pretty much any timber I know, to be honest. And don't forget, you can also um, wax over the top of oil. It's not so easy doing it. Well, it doesn't work quite so well doing the, the opposite way around. Um, uh, oiling, over, uh, oiling over wax doesn't work as well, but sort of um, uh, waxing over oil works, works nicely. Um, but no, just keep building up, experiment. Um, I haven't found a timber that doesn't work that way. All right. Um, let's, do, let's do something that's not very often used now. I want to use French polish. French polish is something, as an apprentice, I used an awful lot. This particular one um, is the Special Pell uh, French polish. Um, you can get the brush-on French polish as well, or the white French polish. Just be a little bit careful when you start going to things like button polish, garnet polishes, all those sorts of things. They're, they're far darker, they're far thicker. The beauty of this one and the brush-on is that they're very liquidy. And for turners, it works stunningly well. Um, you have to work it a little bit more. Um, and again, you can apply um, several coats to make this work. Um, but for me, it's one of those really nostalgic smells. Um, that shellac smell is, is, a, is a really beautiful one. It takes me right back to when I started woodworking. Um, you've got to treat it slightly differently to the, the finishes that we've just used. This doesn't like overworking in terms of applying wet. And so if I keep going with this, what I'll end up doing is this rag will start sticking to it. So maybe a bit of lint-free cloth would work better on that. But all I've done is apply. Now, I'm not going to do anything else to that just yet. It's almost dry because it's a, a spirit or a methylated spirits base. And I want to just wait a little bit. I don't want any tackiness there at all. It's a very sticky substance, is shellac. So we're just waiting a little bit. Again, I would prefer to have some shavings that are slightly wiry as opposed to chips. Don't use pine shavings and don't use U shavings on this because they will stick. And once you get um, shavings stick to French polish, I'm afraid it's sanding back again to take them out. So I'm going to just now burnish. So this, you, you, you imagine a French polisher back in the day, or not even back in the day, nowadays doing a piece of furniture. This process I'm doing would take hours with a rubber, but because we've got the power of the lathe, it's done for us. So we're burnishing. So there's one, one burnish. You can apply another coat and you can carry on, and you can build up the layers just like a French polisher would build up his layers. All right, we're going to start. We're just going to do one layer just in a minute. Um, again, I'm going to hold this up. Let's just take it off and hold it up just to start with. We've got one more process, and it's another substance Substance that you are used to. Oh, I don't need to do that. What am I doing? It's on a screw chuck. Um, another substance that you would be used to as a turner. 
So there we are. Let me just get that light. I've got a bit of a dull spot in the middle there, but I need to work on that. But that's a French polish. You can create a glass finish with French polish. And because we've got the elbow grease of the lathe, um, it's a relatively easy one to do. Go with the thin French polishes. They work the best on the lathe. So avoid button, like I said, but button polish. Garnet polish is far too dark for what we need. But then once you've done your French polish, if you want that extra level of shine, Carnauba wax. This particular one is the Liberon um, wood turner stick, which is a, a mixture between beeswax and Carnauba. But pure Carnauba, this Carnauba, um, Hampshire sheen Carnauba, chestnut Carnauba, they're all going to be brilliant at doing this job. This is one of the... One of the only times I apply directly to timber. If you're going to do that with carnauba wax, because it is so dense and hard, soften an edge. Don't go straight in with a sharp edge, otherwise it'll scratch the timber. And all we're going to do, turn the lay speed up a little bit, a very gentle touch across the surface. Pile of my shavings again. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to burnish. And then buff with a bit of tissue. And then let's just have a look at that. This is the original gloss finish. It's what we're achieving nowadays with waxes. Okay, so there's your carnauba wax. The really hard finish now. Carnauba wax is notoriously hard, hence the, the reason for softening a corner. But you can get a really, really beautiful finish. Bit of French polish, bit of bit of carnauba. We got some more questions. Shall we? I think we better make this the last batch of questions, don't you? We better stop the demonstration. We're going to whip. Don't worry, guys. We're going to do a few more questions. We're then going to end for the day, and I think we'll pick up the um, the, the finishes on the on next Tuesday um, and combine it with the demo that we've got uh, uh, lined up for you then as well. So, just a few more questions. Uh, question from Fred: Would you use? Um, sorry, question from Mike: Would you use the same grain filler for end grain? Uh, yes, no different. Um, absolutely, yeah. The sanding sealer per, per, for end grain, personally, sanding seal at first. Um, what you don't want to be doing is trying to fill tears. The tears have got to disappear. So sanding sealer should do the, the job. And a recommendation for air um, airbrush kits with compressor. Airbrush. So I'm using the SP fifties here. So um, and uh, we do uh, packs of four um, airbrush airbrushes um i think two uh, bottom fed to um gravity fed um and in terms of compressor if you're looking for a mini compressor they, you're not going to get better than this one this is a lovely little compressor you see me using this on these demonstrations all the time um again uh well, i'll try and give you a name off the top of my head um lily would you find the name of this just pop the link up of that little mini compressor for me please airbrush compressor on on the website but that one i mean it's silent i'm right next to it with my mic but that's all it's doing there's no tank on this one so the way it does the um, pressure is continually running it dumps air through this little valve here so i can if i put my finger on that that's just stopping the air coming out but that's how it it regulates right sorry do that it's on the overhead then it regulates there this is my little tells me how much psi i can regulate that by allowing certain amount more air to come through the dump valve all right so it's a nice little nice little airbrush compressor that one okay uh question from james um can you use embellishing waxes like hampshire sheens or some liming wax on the inside of a fruit bowl or would you need to put something over the top? And uh, if so, what would be suitable? Um, over the top of waxes? I I don't think so. It, it, but it, it, I'm not 100% on that one. Um, we'll find out for you on that one. I'll talk to um, 
the finishing companies. I'll talk to Martin, I'll talk to um, Terry, and we'll we'll have a look. Um, whilst we're talking embellishing waxes, that's one thing to consider. If you want to, to use those, you don't want to grain fill. You don't want to use something that's going to create that slurry and fill the grain. You want the pores open. Um, ben, you just pop to that red right pot with the ash one there. You want the pores open. You want the colour to fill um, those pores. So don't do the, the, the finishes that we've used here. You want to, to apply those, put your base colour on. Generally, that's a dark colour in most cases, blue or black. It can be a lacquer, like the, like something like the... the sorry, Ben. Um, it could be a lacquer like the, um, the ebonising lacquer there. It could be a blue um, airbrush stain, dark black airbrush stain, all those sorts of things. But then apply um, your embellishing waxes over the top of that. You, you, it needs to pick out the structure of the timber, you see. So we don't want to fill grain when we're doing that. Was that French polish put on bare wood? It was, yeah, there was no sanding sealer there whatsoever. So I'm using the French polish to create, to be my sealer. And um, with French polish, like oils, you build them up. You put several coats on. So apply this, the, um, the French polish. Burnish is doing the job of the um, abrasive. So you're actually using shavings to, to take off the risen grain. Um, once you've done that once, generally that's enough um, in terms of taking off risen grain because the grain is locked in then. Then apply your light coats afterwards and burnish buff, burnish buff. Keep, keep going with it and the grains, of the finish slowly raises. So it kind of follows on to a question from Frederick here. Um, what is the difference between burnishing and buffing? Burnishing, but so burnishing, we're generating pressure and heat. Buffing, we're leveling down the surface. So if you think about burnishing, um, I was using the shavings there. We're taking off excess, but we do create very minute lines. Buffing is with a softer material, and you're leveling down, smoothing down all those little lines to create a brighter finish. For instance, if I'm using um, a burnishing wheel, stitched mop, that's um, that's going to be used for burn, burnishing. You're applying an abrasive compound, sorry, abrasive compound. But the buffing wheel is very soft um, and smooths everything down afterwards. Generally applied the, the wax polish like um, like Carnauba. Okay, one thing we didn't cover today, which we will next one as well. Okay. Any more for any more? We're all done. Guys, I'm really sorry we didn't get to all of those polishes and finishes. We will get to them next Tuesday. Remember, same time, three o'clock in this workshop. Now, tomorrow we've got Ben doing Tormek. So he's going to be answering some of your Tormek sharpening questions. And I think particularly looking at the T4 and the rotating base. So come back for, for that tomorrow, three o'clock. And then on Thursday, we've got Bouncer V Table Saw. So uh, if you're having any thoughts and dilemmas as to which one you should pick, that's your day to come back at three o'clock. So, guys, thank you ever so much for taking part, uh, asking me all the questions um, and for supporting us. So until next Tuesday from me, that's goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>